This episode of the Children's Literature Podcast is brought to you by Feisty Women. Feisty Women, high five a few today. I hope you enjoyed the little April Fool's joke last week, and I hope you're not too disappointed that this won't remain the Juvenile Delinquency Podcast. Chloe and I did have a lot of fun making that episode, though. But for now, it's back to wholesome episodes that are about Anne of Green Gables instead of advice on the best ways to kick people. Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote Anne of Green Gables as a way to look back to her childhood in the 1880s in Canada. When it was published in 1908, it was hugely popular because of its lovable heroine and realistic engaging plot, but it also had nostalgia going for it, in the same way that TV shows like Happy Days or That 70s Show did. Montgomery managed this by loading this novel with pop culture references. Montgomery refers to literature, music, and poetry in her writing about as often as Kevin Smith references movies and comic books in his films. And she references poetry most often. I was able to spot 19 different mentions of poems in Anne of Green Gables, and I'm sure there's some that I missed. Sometimes the poems are mentioned by name, as in this passage from chapter 5, when Marilla tries to find out a little bit about what Anne's life has been like before she was mistakenly sent to Prince Edward Island. Did you ever go to school? demanded Marilla, turning the sorrel mare down the shore road. Not a great deal. I went a little the last year I stayed with Mrs. Thomas. When I went up river, we were so far from a school that I couldn't walk it in winter, and there was vacation in summer, so I could only go in the spring and fall. But, of course, I went when I was at the asylum. I can read pretty well, and I know ever so many pieces of poetry off by heart. The Battle of Hohenlinden, and Edinburgh after Flodden, and Bingen on the Rhine, and lots of The Lady of the Lake, and most of The Seasons by James Thompson. Don't you just love poetry that gives you a crinkly feeling up and down your back? There's a piece in the fifth reader, The Downfall of Poland, that is just full of thrills. Of course, I wasn't in the fifth reader, I was only in the fourth, but the big girls used to lend me theirs to read. A whole lot of things have just been referenced which, back in 1908, older readers would have instantly recognized and younger readers would have mostly known about. It makes sense that Marilla asks Anne, an 11-year-old girl, if she ever went to school. In the 1880s, only about half of Canadian kids attended school at all. In 1908, that number was much higher and rapidly rising. Anne also mentions the readers, which were the book system that children learned out of back then. Kids were taught according to their ability, not their age. And when a student mastered the content in the first reader, it was time to move on to the second reader. Poetry was a very important part of 19th century culture. It wasn't just read silently at home, but out loud, at school, and in public. Memorizing and reciting popular poems was a common thing, and people would eagerly attend events where a favorite poem was to be recited. The speaker's expression and delivery was very important. It's easy to see why Anne and her friends would get so excited about the chance to go out and hear a recital in an age before radio, television, the internet, and social media. I don't have time to talk about all the wonderful poems that are referenced in Anne of Green Gables, but two stand out to me as being the most important. The first is Bingen on the Rhine. This poem's first mentioned in that passage from Chapter 5 that I read. It was written by Caroline Norton, an author and women's rights activist whose story could fill a hundred podcast episodes. In addition to being an accomplished poet, she successfully campaigned for laws that gave women the right to be recognized as individuals under the law, with the same rights to divorce, child custody, and property ownership as men. She was very politically active in the years leading up to the period in which Anne of Green Gables was set, so by including her work in this novel, Lucy Maud Montgomery was saying to young readers in 1908, Hey, go check out this feisty lady who fought for women's rights. This is especially important to remember since this was the time when Canadian women were fighting for the right to vote. They wouldn't actually get that right in federal elections until 1918, 10 years after Anne of Green Gables was published. So this really says something about Lucy Maud Montgomery's politics and her feelings about women's rights at a time when they weren't at all secure. 
The fact that she's able to slip it into the narrative so naturally and without any sense of preaching a message separate from the plot of Anne of Green Gables shows off both her intelligence and her skill as a writer. The poem's mentioned again in chapter 19 when Gilbert Blythe recites it at a public performance. The program that night was a series of thrills for at least one listener in the audience and, as Anne assured Diana, Every succeeding thrill was thrillier than the last. When Prissy Andrews, attired in a new pink silk waist with a string of pearls about her smooth white throat and real carnations in her hair, rumor whispered that the master had sent all the way to town for them for her, climbed the slimy ladder, dark without one ray of light, and shivered in luxurious sympathy. When the choir sang, far above the gentle daisies, and gazed at the ceiling as if it were frescoed with angels. When Sam Sloan proceeded to explain and illustrate how Sockery set a hen, Anne laughed until people sitting near her laughed too, more out of sympathy with her than with amusement at a selection that was rather threadbare even in Avonlea. And when Mr. Phillips gave Mark Antony's oration over the dead body of Caesar in the most heart-stirring tones, looking at Prissy Andrews at the end of every sentence, Anne felt that she could rise and mutiny on the spot if but one Roman citizen led the way. Only one number on the program failed to interest her. When Gilbert Blythe recited Bingen on the Rhine, Anne picked up Rhoda Murray's library book and read it until he had finished, when she sat rigidly stiff and motionless, while Diana clapped her hands until they tingled. It was eleven when they got home, sated with dissipation, but with the exceeding sweet pleasure of talking it all over still to come. Everybody seemed asleep, and the house was dark and silent. Anne and Diana tiptoed into the parlor, a long, narrow room out of which the spare room opened. It was pleasantly warm and dimly lighted by the embers of a fire in the grate. Let's undress here, said Diana. It's so nice and warm. Hasn't it been a delightful time, sighed Anne rapturously. It must be splendid to get up and recite there. Do you suppose we'll ever be asked to do it, Diana? Yes, of course, some day. They're always wanting the big scholars to recite. Gilbert Blythe does often, and he's only two years older than us. Oh, Anne, how could you pretend not to listen to him? When he came to the line, there's another, not a sister. He looked right down at you. Diana, said Anne with dignity, you are my bosom friend, but I cannot allow even you to speak to me of that person. Are you ready for bed? Oh, Teen Romance. When I was a teenager, the way you told somebody you liked them was with a mixtape. It took a while to make mixtapes. You had to get out the boombox, do all the calculations to figure out how many songs you could fit on each side without leaving too much dead space at the end, and then carefully select songs based on their titles and lyrics so that you could send the right message to the recipient. A good mixtape can say a lot of things like, we're going to have an amazing summer, or... I'm so glad you're my best friend, or I like you. Do you like me back? It would seem that in the 1880s, the same kind of meaning would go into the selection and performance of poetry. Reciting poetry was a type of acting in which the emotions and intentions of the author and performer would be blended. Bingen on the Rhine is a poem about a soldier who lies mortally wounded. As he dies, he gives messages to a comrade begging them to be sent on to his loved ones in his hometown, Bingen on the Rhine, or Bingen am Rhein, as it's known in German. He first sends brave and consoling thoughts to his brothers, his mother, and his sister, but then he comes to the most important farewell, the one that's to another, not a sister. He laments that he'll never see her again, and that the life they had planned together will never happen. Gilbert Blythe has chosen a perfect poem to recite here, he deeply offended Anne in their first meeting, teasing her, then calling her carrots and tugging on her bright red hair. He could not have known how sensitive she was about her hair color or how explosive her temper could be. 
but he found out when she jumped up in the middle of class and broke her slate right on his head. Remarkably, Gilbert made a few efforts to apologize after this, but Anne vowed never to forgive him, and she was always cold and stiff toward him. By choosing Bingen on the Rhine to recite in front of all the kids from school, Gilbert is lamenting the fact that he'll never get the chance to know Anne. He's also confessing that he's got a big old crush on her. But as you heard, Anne isn't having any of it. I really like her reaction because I can't help but have two feelings about it. On one hand, she really is way too stubborn and should have forgiven Gilbert ages ago for what was some pretty mild teasing. But on the other hand, I'm glad Anne's the kind of girl who isn't just going to fall over in vapors for a guy just because he spouts off some poetry in front of all their friends. It's a chapter that perfectly shows the messiness and angst of teen romance and reminds us that kids just have to figure this stuff out, and that takes time. But don't worry, dear listeners. Anne forgives Gilbert, eventually, but she forgives him big time. Here's the full text of Bingen on the Rhine, and while, of course, I can't convey it with the same sensitivity as a young Gilbert Blythe, I hope that when you're listening to it, you get an idea of the different feelings people would have had when listening. You would have had Anne, who is stonily sitting there trying not to let any part of it touch her heart. You would have had Gilbert, who was hopefully and probably nervously anticipating her response. And then you had Diana, who was just kind of swept up in the performance of it all and a little bit impressed with the audacity of his romantic gesture. Bingen on the Rhine by Caroline Elizabeth Norton a soldier of the legion lay dying in Algiers. There was lack of woman's nursing. There was dearth of woman's tears. But a comrade stood beside him while his lifeblood ebbed away and bent with pitying glances to hear what he might say. The dying soldier faltered, and he took that comrade's hand, and he said, I never more shall see my own, my native land. Take a message and a token to some distant friends of mine. For I was born at Bingen, at Bingen on the Rhine. Tell my brothers and companions, when they meet and crowd around, to hear my mournful story in the pleasant vineyard ground, that we fought the battle bravely, and when the day was done, full many a corpse lay ghastly pale beneath the setting sun. And midst the dead and dying were some grown old in wars, the death wound on their gallant breast, the last of many scars. But some were young and suddenly beheld life's morn decline, and one had come from Bingen, fair Bingen on the Rhine. Tell my mother that her other sons shall comfort her old age, and I was I a truant bird, that thought his home a cage. For my father was a soldier, and even as a child, my heart leaped forth to hear him tell of struggles fierce and wild. And when he died and left us to divide his scanty hoard, I let them take whate'er they would. But I kept my father's sword, and with boyish love I hung it where the bright light used to shine. On the cottage wall at Bingen, calm Bingen on the Rhine. Tell my sister not to weep for me and sob with drooping head when the troops are marching home again with glad and gallant tread, but to look upon them proudly with a calm and steadfast eye, for her brother was a soldier too and not afraid to die, and if a comrade seek her love, I ask her in my name to listen to him kindly, without regret or shame, and to hang the old sword in its place, my father's sword and mine. For the honor of old Bingen, dear Bingen on the Rhine. There's another, not a sister, in the happy days gone by. You'd have known her by the merriment that sparkled in her eye. Too innocent for coquetry, too fond for idle scorning. Oh, friend, I fear the lightest heart makes sometimes heaviest mourning. Tell her the last night of my life, for ere the moon be risen, my body will be out of pain, my soul be out of prison. I dreamed I stood with her and saw the yellow sunlight shine on the vine-clad hills of Bingen, fair Bingen on the Rhine. 
I saw the blue Rhine sweep along. I heard, or seemed to hear, the German songs we used to sing in chorus sweet and clear. And down the pleasant river, and up the slanting hill, the echoing chorus sounded, though the evening calm and still. And her glad blue eyes were on me, as we passed with friendly talk, down many a path beloved of yore, and well-remembered walk. And her little hand lay lightly, confidingly in mine. But we'll meet no more at Bingen, loved Bingen on the Rhine. His voice grew faint and hoarser. His grasp was childish weak. His eyes put on a dying look. He sighed and ceased to speak. His comrade bent to lift him, but the spark of life had fled. The soldier of the legion in a foreign land was dead. And the soft moon rose up slowly, and calmly she looked down on the red sand of the battlefield with bloody corpses strown. Yea, calmly on that dreadful scene, her pale light seemed to shine, as it shone on distant Bingen, fair Bingen on the Rhine. Next week, I'll talk about the other poem that's very important to the plot of Anne of Green Gables, The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Tennyson. This one shows Anne's devotion to Romanticism and her affinity for the style and values of the Pre-Raphaelite movement, which I talked about back in the episode about clothing fashions in this novel. It's also a poem that ends up having hilarious and adorable consequences for Anne and Gilbert's relationship. After that, I'm afraid I'll have to cut myself off from talking about any more poetry in Anne of Green Gables, because Lucy Maud Montgomery put so many references into this book that I could fill the entire year's worth of shows just on this topic. If you and your kids have not previously heard of Caroline Norton or read any of her poetry, this is a great opportunity to do a little research. She's a remarkable and inspiring figure in women's history, and her poems are quite beautiful. I wish that memorizing and reciting poetry was still part of the school curriculum and the social life of teenagers, because not only is it fun, but it's incredibly good for children. Reciting memorized poems acts as a kind of therapy for stuttering, and the rhythm and rhyme of verse are easier to memorize than prose. Children can have a lot of fun selecting poems and then putting their own personality into the performance. And children will find writing their own poems much easier if they've studied others' poetry first. And perhaps if they need to find a way to flirt in the same awkward, adorable way that Gilbert Blythe did, they might find poetry a good way to do it. <laughs> 